Mike Lombardi, NFL Network. 50 hours of combine coverage starts today at 2.30 Eastern with the player and coach press conferences. Workouts begin Saturday at 9 Eastern. Uh, Jim Ursay in the building there today, Mike? I haven't seen him, but uh, he's probably searching the, the song there charts for some information. I don't know. It's always like a crossword puzzle with him. You've got to try to interpret what he's trying to say. Uh, he can. I read something where he can sign Andrew Luck as early as tomorrow. Is that true? Well, he can do it, yeah, because, well, he has to find out. He has to wait for what his cap allotment is in terms of rookie salary pool. And then once he finds that out, then he can go ahead and proceed. But I think he can get that earlier with the new collective bargaining agreement. Any chance that it's not Andrew Luck and Robert Griffin the third? Uh, you know, I, I, I get the sense that it's Andrew Luck from people that I've talked to in and with out of the Colts organization. That's the direction they seem to want to go. Uh, I would be surprised if it wasn't. Uh, I, here's another thing that always concerned me. And you're a former front office guy. But the Wonderlick test scores... When I take that test, do I know then that everybody is going to have the knowledge of what I did on that test? Do I sign over my privacy rights when I take that test? Not really, because oftentimes, and you know, tragically because of the educational system in America, some people take the tests that are not great readers. So as an executive, you've got to do other tests to find out, because that test isn't black or white. That test isn't that you're smart or dumb. That test just allows you to take another step forward. So you obviously have a lot of psychological testing you can do where you can find some things out about players that perhaps may be lower in reading but have higher level intelligence. So it's just not easy enough to say, yeah, he's smart, yeah, he's dumb. You've got to keep pro and keep finding ways and then the other thing you're talking about football intelligence so what you like to do is make sure you bring a guy in put him on the blackboard see if he can retain it come back two or three days later and see what he remembers those are the key components of really understanding football and understanding what player you're dealing with what if a player says i'm, I'm just not going to take the wonder lick because you know i'll take it for a team but i i, I don't want it displayed uh, publicly here whether i'm really smart or i'm going to get a mediocre score or a low score i'm just not going to do it you know, if he, I, I would think as an executive, I, would, I wouldn't I would care. And then I would just bring him in for interviews and make a determination based on without the test. I think sometimes the test, as I said earlier, it's not always concrete. So you're always trying to find different ways and different things to do. I mean, look, there were certain players in, in the league that had low test scores that played really smart, played, played hard, and played consistently all the time. And I think it's just not an, an area where you can easily say. I think it gives you an idea. Certainly each position has different levels of Wonderlick test scores, and they're a base line scores and then you go from there what's the red flag during the interview process well you know with the interview process i always like to make sure the player knew that i knew more about him than he was going to tell me and i think that's the way you have to start the interview i would always start an interview with all that basically i would say to the player look i know every answer to every question i'm going to ask you i just want to see if you're going to lie to me and proceed from there because you have to know the player's <laughs> background You've got to know exactly what you're asking him. You've got to go back to his high school and talk about his principal. You've got to talk about somebody in his high school that he that allows him to know you know. And now you're going to get to the truth because now he's worried about telling about lying to you. You can usually tell when a guy starts squirming and he gives you the standard answer. And you've got to be pro. If you ask if you ask simple questions, you're going to get simple answers. You've got to ask direct and really probing questions to get the right answers you're looking for. Legally, are you allowed to ask me about drug use? You know, uh, I certainly think if it comes up in your in your past and it's public record, you certainly can ask about what happened in a certain situation because it's already been publicly out there. But how could uh, you get to that topic if it's just whisper or rumor? Well, I, I think you kind of work around it. I think you have to try to find a way to where find out what his social life is. Ask him what he does, and you know, on weekends, you know, where has he been? You know, who does he hang around with? I think you have different ways to find out the conclusions. I think ultimately, you are who you hang around with, and I think that can allow you to know exactly what's going on. Certainly, if you've got some issues off the field, you're going to be around some areas that you shouldn't be. What is the uh, one aspect of the combine where people overreach, overreact to? I think the 40 time, I really do. I think the 40 time, it's all about the start. You know, we have a starter here at the, at the combine. So that really makes everything standardized. And then when they go to their on field workouts, there's not the really 
the, the, the discipline start time. So there is a variable there that you've got to equate to. There's a variable in terms of the, a lot of the players do weight, weight training in terms of the lower bodies before they run. So that affects it. And then you've got to be able to understand if he has a bad start and where that plays into. You've got to analyze the 40. You just can't look at the number and you've got to think about, then you've got to watch the other drills. I mean, for corners, for example, it's a change of direction drill that's as important as the 40 time. Because look, if, if Dan, if you're a 6 1 corner and you run 4 5 2 and you're a 5 9 corner and you run 4 4 6, your arm length is going to be significantly different that you're basically running the same speed. He's Mike Lombardi, NFL Network analyst, joining us from Indianapolis, the NFL Combine. Um, if you don't throw at the Combine, is that a red flag signal anything to you? No, because if, if you don't throw at the Combine and I'm going to draft a quarterback, I'm bringing footballs with me for you to throw. <laughs> I think the league has gotten to the point where we've allowed footballs. I mean, look at the look at the 49er game against the Giants. You can see the ball that Alex Smith was throwing. It looked like a ball you and I played with when we were kids in the backyard. It was beat up and rusty. And, and if the league allows you to get away with that, then God bless and go ahead. But typically, you know, those K-balls come out. They're not as really worn down as you want them to be. So you want to make sure that any prospect you're working out has a football that's going to be similar to the football he's going to throw in an NFL game and so therefore you can watch every quarterback has a favorite ball you know it's like Linus's favorite blanket I mean they're going to bring it out there and let you throw it and they'll throw it really good you got to bring your own footballs and make sure they throw those and let's say in a week from now give me one two three players that we're talking about that maybe we weren't going into the combine you know that I think that's all off. I think we're going to talk about more positions. I think there's more offensive linemen. Mike Adams, the big offensive tackle from Ohio State. I think you're going to talk about him more because he's got the arm length. He's got the athletic ability. He doesn't have the durability or the play time, but he's one of those guys that people tend to think the glass is half full and they're going to take a reach for him. I, I also went, you know, it's just, it's sort of fascinating where you have this meat market there and you're trying to figure out who can play. And to me, I just want to know if you love football. I don't know how you ask that question, Mike, but to me, I go back to Ryan Leaf. I don't think Ryan loved football. Peyton Manning loved football. And to me, that's such a big difference maker. You know, ability-wise, a lot of these guys are equal. It's who lives it, loves it, and, and I don't know how, that, how valuable that would be for you when you worked in the front office. That was the most important. I mean, you got to go back to the campus, and you can't wear your uniform. You can't wear your team colors. you got to get on that campus and find out what a guy does. And if you would have gone to Washington State, I think you would have found out that Ryan Leaf really liked to, liked to do things off the field more than really prepare. And I think if you would have gone to Tennessee, you would have found out that Peyton Manning was a workaholic. I think you could find the answers to any questions you want to ask. you just got to be willing to spend the time and be probing. I mean, Jamarcus Russell, for example, they would have been, you know, if you would have done deep enough and dig deep enough, they would have told you there were some red flags in that situation, that money he could spoil him. And then you've got to answer that question, Dan. If I give him a large sum of money, is he going to love the game? Do you still love the game? I mean, we all have to love the game, whether you're an executive coach or a player. And oftentimes, if money's going to spoil us, if success is going to spoil us, that's never good. And you've got to find out what happens. I mean, the reason for success is to maintain excellence. It's not to just be satisfied. Uh, before I let you go, uh, the number of running backs who have now been devalued <laughs> that go in the first round. Uh, well, I think Richardson obviously is a unique talent, and I think it's going to dwindle from there. I, I think it's a, it's. I think what's helped running backs a little bit, Dan, is the, val- the salary cap. The rookie pool has gone down, so now you don't have to spend a fortune for a back. But remember, lifespan for running backs are going to be four to five years, and ultimately, when you draft in the first round, you're hoping to get two contracts out of the player, a four-year contract and an extension. Oftentimes, running backs don't always allow you that luxury. Great stuff. We uh, hope to talk to you soon, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Mike Lombardi, NFL Network.